In this chapter, we are going to discuss operating system structures. We will first talk about system services and then the interface uh, to these services through the system calls. And then we will talk about the system's programs. We will also discuss the design and implementation issues of operating systems as well as structure, debugging and generation. And we will also talk about how a computer system boots. So the objectives of this uh, chapter are uh, to describe the services, uh, system services provided to users. It is possible that instead of a human user, you also have a, a program. Or alternatively, uh, you could also have, for example, a cyber physical system. For example, uh, in the case of Industry 4.0 or factory automation, uh, the user maybe it's not a human being or a program, but it's a machine in the factory. That's also possible. So uh, we'll be discussing about those cases. Also, we'll talk about how a computer system is installed, customized, and then how it uh, really boots. The system services provided by an operating system could be classified in several categories. So let's first focus on the system services that are uh, targeting the uh, user directly. So the first thing we need to discuss is, of course, the user interface. You can have an operating system that has a command line interface, CLI. Uh, the command line is actually that typically black uh, screen where you have the prompt and at the prompt uh, you enter a command followed by zero or more parameters. What happens is the following. The, uh, the command uh, line, uh, the shell actually, reads the command entered by the user at the command line and the following parameters. It takes that string and processes the string uh, such that the first token in, the, uh, in that string is the command and the others are the parameters. So it first looks at the command. The command could be either a built-in command or an, another program, okay? By a built-in command, we mean commands like change directory, make directory, remove directory, uh, delete files, list uh, the files in a directory, or list the file in a directory in a recursive manner. However, you need uh, that. Uh, such things would be, uh, you can also do it, actually a little bit of programming there. Uh, for example, you can uh, have for loops, if statements, while statements, if you wish, even at the command line, that's possible. Uh, that's used in scripting. So uh, the command line provides you uh, this kind of uh, direct access. Now, the shell, as I said, will take the command and then give the parameters uh, of that command as arguments and that command corresponds to actually a function in the shell, it will execute that function with those parameters. If it's not a command line, uh, sorry, if it's not a built-in command, but it's a extra program and other program in the system, then the shell will find that command, hopefully, and run that command by giving those parameters as the command line arguments. So actually, what you get, for example, in C language as argv, the array of strings, is the array of those tokens that are the parameters to the command at the command line. So uh, if the command itself is not a, a built-in command, the shell will try to find the corresponding file, which needs to be an executable file, in the path. The path is actually an environment variable of the shell, uh, which is simply a list of directories. So the shell looks at the first directory in the path, goes to that directory, 
and tries to find that com a, a file with the name of that command in the uh, in that directory if it can find it it will run that program and give these parameters as arguments to that program uh, they will be the argv of that program if there is no executable file in that directory with that command name then it will look at the next directory in the path and the next one and the next one until it finds a command with that name the first occurrence of that prog uh, of that program with that name in the path is the one that's taken it's possible that in the following directories you also have programs with the same name but it will run the first one it finds if it cannot find it at all now the shell will say it will give an error message saying there is no built-in command or program executable program with that name now uh, the command line is very flexible that's a nice thing uh, especially in the case of unix derivatives for example you can pipe the output of one command to the other and that one to another to another to another so in unix for example we can typically write complex commands which constitute of actually multiple commands some have piped or related to each other that's actually how we can do uh, for example shell scripting okay depending on your shell whatever shell is for example if it's bash shell then you do bash scripting this way so this is nice as long as you know how to use it but it is also difficult because you need to know all commands and it's not very user friendly so typically system administrators deal with this a more user uh, friendly approach is of course using the graphical user interface the GUI uh, this is what you're actually used to you have it in uh, Windows uh, in Mac OS and also in Unix systems uh, but this is typically for the ordinary users uh, it's easy to use you can find whatever you want in front of you on the screen in a visible uh, uh, manner so that's why it's uh, so much popular yet another approach is the batch systems the batch user interface the batch user interface is not something uh, you're very familiar with uh, it's not very common but uh, it's still used and it's very useful uh, the idea is the following most of the computer systems you've been using are personal computer systems the PCs and the uh, re the idea is uh, there is typically one user the owner of the computer and that person is using it however uh, in research centers or in large companies for example there are cases where we need some specific computers to be used by many people but these computers are not to be used uh, in an interactive manner for example uh, in some banks you still have mainframe computers i'm not talking about uh, typically those computers but more specific purpose computers for example we have uh, several systems like that in our department and uh, in the Tetam research center in Kandilli uh, for example we have the GPU server now this is a specific purpose computer system where we have tens of thousands of uh, GPU uh, cores uh, tensor cores that are used for very complex simulations now these are very expensive systems so they're not dedicated to a single researcher a single graduate student or professor this is something to be shared and also it, it doesn't require uh, interactivity by interactivity i mean like when you're using windows you're using the mouse when you move the mouse you expect the mouse pointer to move on the screen in that case although at the moment many programs are running on my computer system the operating system has to give precedence priority to the 
process that's updating the position of the mouse. So that if I move it up, uh, if I move my uh, mouse up, the mouse pointer should also move up on the screen. Okay, so this is interactivity. Or if I'm typing something, if I'm writing a letter, I would expect the characters to appear immediately. Otherwise, if it delays the display of the characters, I would write and maybe skip some characters and they would just appear, say, one minute later. So uh, I will not even realize that. And it will also be very difficult for me to write if I don't see what I'm writing. So these are the interactive systems and these are the systems you're using daily. The systems I'm talking about are different. Like you're doing your thesis, at some point you have to do some simulations. You d develop the simulator not on that computer system which is very valuable for us and that's to be shared. So you develop it on your own desktop or laptop, whatever. And then when it's time to run the simulations, you we say submit your job to the system. That means you write the program, you test the program to see there are no bugs in it, and you prepare your data. When it is time to run the program on that data, and you know that your program takes a lot of time because you're doing very heavy simulations, you transfer your data and the uh, program executable to the server and then say, run this program with these parameters on this data. Now, you don't expect the result immediately. That's why it doesn't require interactivity. You say, run this and tell me when it's ready. Or maybe I'm going to come back and look at it maybe six hours later, maybe tomorrow, maybe uh, by the weekend, because I know that it will take a lot of time, one. And number two, I know that there are many other people running also very heavy simulations on the computer system. Okay, so in this case, since there is no interactivity, which means uh, as in the case of moving the mouse or typing something, the user does not expect immediate output, but expects the output six hours later or by the, uh, by the weekend. We don't need to try to be interactive. In the case of an interactive system, the CPU would have to switch to the process that's updating the position of the mouse pointer on my screen very frequently. And that context switch between this process and the other processes actually consumes a lot of CPU time, which means the context switch itself brings more overhead to the system. In the case of that GPU server case, we don't have, need that interaction. Therefore, the system does not need to switch between the processes to provide interactivity because we don't want interactivity, okay? Therefore, uh, the system will work with one task until that task is either complete or it needs to do I.O. and then switch to the others. So rarely there is a context switch compared to a regular interactive system. So this is the idea of batch systems because you're submitting your jobs in a batch. It's a batch of jobs. That means a collection of jobs. And the operating system looks at them and picks the one to be executed. Which one, that's what we're going to discuss in the following chapters, uh, goes with that. Only when necessary, it switches to the another one, not every, say, 10 milliseconds. So this is one thing, the user interface. Another service, system service, is a program execution. There should be a means of loading your program into the memory and running it. Now remember, the program is the executable file on your disk, okay? When you double click the program icon in the case of a graphical user interface or type the name of the program in the case of the command line interface or in the batch uh, job list, you give the name of that program. In all three cases, you're just starting the program. When you try to start a program on the disk, you actually create a process out of that program 
uh, which resides on the disk. So the program still remains on the disk, but you create a live instance out of that program in the memory. That's called a process. Now, if you, for example, double click the program once again, it would create another instance. That's another process. Another process out of the same program. But these are two separate processes. Like if you close this one, this will disappear. Nothing will happen to this one because these are two separate instances from the same program, but these are two separate processes. Now, how do you create a process out of a program that is uh, something uh, to be uh, developed carefully? This is called loading the process. Loading is reading the program from the disk and creating the process in the memory. Note that the process is not an exact copy of what you have on the disk. So process is not an exact copy of program. The process is created according to what's said in the program. We will discuss it in uh, further detail, but for example, there is something called a data segment that's part of the process. It's not inside the executable on the disk. Just in that program, it says, I need a data uh, segment of this size. So it will create a data segment of that size and also says, in the data segment, I need such variables. These are the initial values. So the program describes what needs to be done, how the process should be created. And the loader looks at the program and creates the process as defined by the program. So you need a loader. You should have mechanisms for running that process. And you should have mechanisms for understanding the end of the process when the process ends, and when it ends, release that memory space for the uh, process. Actually, not only the memory space, as we will discuss later, you will see that, for example, the process opens a file and say you forgot to close the file, or maybe your program crashed before closing the file. So it is the operating system's responsibility to make sure that if a process terminates, all the resources like files, logs, devices, memory space, all these resources are released back. We call it reclaiming the resources. So the operating system should be able to reclaim the resources. In other words, get the resources back from the process. Otherwise, if you don't do this properly, for example, if you're not able to reclaim all of the memory and some piece of memory which was earlier allocated to the process, say with malloc or something else, and then when the process ends, you forget to deallocate it, release it, reclaim it, then that piece of memory remains as being used by someone but in fact, that someone is gone, but still it is marked as in use. It's a part of memory that no one can use. So when a new process is created and it wants memory, you cannot give that part of the memory. Okay, that will get the rest from the rest of the memory. But if this program is, for example, executed many times in every execution, it will take some part from the memory and not release it. Take some part, not release it. Take some part, not release it. And at some point, you might realize that you're running out of memory. Okay, you may get an error message like out of memory. And you kill all processes. You say, I should have uh, released a lot of memory. But when you look at the free memory in the system, you see that most of the memory still appears to be in use. And you cannot explain that. That's what we call a memory leak, because there is a leak from your memory management system. You're not aware of that, but some drops of memory have leaked out of your memory management system, and those drops have become so large that now they consume a, quite a portion of your memory. So you need to be able to deal with these. Also, for the execution uh, of a program, 
as I said, you come to the end of the program, like you come to the last statement in the main function and you say return zero, one, whatever you want. Uh, so that would be a normal termination of the program. But the program could also end in an abnormal manner. The program crashes, okay? Like you do an illegal memory access and the operating system is responsible for checking that you don't do like something like that. If you try to access some memory that you're not allowed to access, we say the operating system in codes kills that process. So when the process gets killed, that's abnormal termination. And as I said earlier, you should be able to find all the resources allocated to this process and reclaim them. There are a couple of other things you also need to do. For example, if somebody started this process, you should inform that person or maybe another process started this process. So that other process, the one that created, which we call the parent process, should be informed that the child process has been killed. Or if it terminates, the parent process should again be informed that uh, the child process has terminated in a normal manner. So it is the responsibility of the operating system also to make sure that a program ends and to understand whether it ended normally or in abnormal manner. Also, the operating system should be providing means of doing I.O. because all processes typically need to do I.O. You could be doing I.O. with the disk. You know, you could be reading files or directories, but also you would typically be reading from the console. So you read from the keyboard, you get the uh, position or click values from the mouse, or if it's a touch screen, uh, you get the uh, location, touch uh, coordinates on the screen, or you want to display something on the screen. Okay, you want to display a string or draw something on the screen. So these are all I.O. You could also be doing other types of I.O. Like you could be communicating, we'll come to communications later, over Ethernet or Wi-Fi, whatever. You could be or uh, over Bluetooth, for example, with your Bluetooth mouse. Or you could, for example, have connected some specific devices to your computer system, either over USB, like the camera over USB, or maybe, uh, for example, if you're trying to control some hardware, some external machine, you could have some uh, signals coming from them. So all these are type of IO. The operating system should provide you means for doing input-output. What else? Well, we have the file system on the disk. So the operating system should provide means for managing a file system. There are zillions of different types of file systems for different purposes. Some are old, some are new, some are not used uh, anymore. Some are still used, although they are quite old because they were still very useful or their systems still using that. But for example, uh, if you're using uh, a Windows system, it will format your disk or USB stick, whatever, either in VFAT format or NTFS format. If you're using a Linux system, it would typically use X3 or X4 systems, but we do have other types of file systems also. And for each of these file systems, the way things are organized are quite different. The way NTFS works is very, very different than the way VFAT works, although they are both used by Windows. And both of them are quite different than X3, X4 file systems used by Linux. There are journal file systems that keep a lot of record of almost everything. So there are many different things, but in general, a file system should provide means of creating directories, uh, creating directories in directories, removing directories, renaming them, creating files, deleting files, moving them around, renaming files, setting the permissions, 
uh, and also when you try to access looking at those permissions and deciding whether you have the right to read or not also when you want to uh, for example, create a file in the file system in a specific directory. The file system is responsible for making changes in the directory because there is now a new file there. Setting the permissions and also allocating space for that file on the disk. And whenever you do I.O. operations uh, on that space, and you fill that block, you come to the end of the block. Now the file wants to grow further. So it's the file system creates, that creates, that allocates a new block to the same file so that you can do I.O. to that new block. But also it's the responsibility of the file system to update all necessary data structures to show that now this file has two blocks this is the first one, this is the second one. You should be able to access all of the blocks and also you should be able to, you should know the exact order. You should know how much of each block is used. What if you remove something from the previous block? Are you going to move everything up or keep that part empty later if something is to be written, you can write it there or not? All this kind of details is managed by the file system. And as I said, depending on the type of the file system, you need another uh, implementation for that file system. Communications, now, one, uh, there are two different ways of doing communications. You either do communications with other computers on the network, or you do communications with the other processes on the same computer system. That's also possible. On the same computer system, two processes could be talking to each other. So uh, communications uh, system services provides you all that detail. The uh, communications in the same computer system could be done either over shared memory. That means this process has its own memory space. This process has its own memory space, but there is a small memory space up here that's shared by both of them. But then there are many things we should be uh, careful with in that case. Like if these two processes try to read or write to the uh, shared memory at the same time, you may have some conflicts and uh, garbage data. So we have to deal with that. That's yet two other chapters we're going to discuss in this course. In a computer system, there will always be errors. Okay, so the operating system is responsible for following the errors and if they occur, it should take care of them. So uh, problems may occur because of the CPU uh, or at the CPU, let me say. Uh, it may occur uh, in the memory with the I.O. systems or with the programs themselves. So it's the responsibility of the operating system to de detect all of these. Now, each one of these is a different type of error. So for each one, there's a different type of action you need to take. So it's the operating system's responsibility to uh, take the appropriate action and ensure that, yeah, okay, there has been a problem. I've identified the problem, that's one thing. So realizing, detecting the problem is one thing. I have isolated the problem. That means there is a problem here, but it affects only this process, not the others. So you should be also able to isolate the problem. Sometimes some problems may affect more than one process. That's also possible. Like the disk fails, there could be several processes that are using that uh, disk specifically. So several of them will be affected. And we would like to make sure that the failure of one process does not create a cascading effect like this process fails, so it causes the failure of this one, and that causes the failure of this one. So just like domino stones, the whole system crashes. We would like to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, also, if errors occurs, uh, occur, you should have some ways of debugging. 
okay, you know how to debug your own programs. But how about this case? Your uh, program is running, suddenly it crashes. And all you learn from the operating system is something like your program failed. Now, this doesn't help at all. Now, at least you know there's a problem, but you have no idea what the problem is, so you cannot solve it. So the operating system should say, beyond saying there is a problem, it should say there is this kind of a problem, like illegal memory access or a network failure, whatever. It should tell you what the problem is. Now, saying illegal memory access also is not sufficient. Okay? Okay, there is an illegal memory access, but which pointer caused the problem? What happened? So to do that, for example, you can configure the operating system to dump the memory of the process that failed. Dumping the memory means when the error occurs, before removing the process and re uh, reclaiming all of its resources, the operating system, before doing anything, takes a byte-by-byte -byte copy of the memory and writes it in a file. That's what we call the core dump or the memory dump also, but the more common word is a core dump. So it writes a core dump on the disk and then kills your program, reclaims all resources and says core dumped. Now you can use a debugger to load that uh, core dump and see the whole memory of your process from the eyes of your process that was killed at the very last moment, the moment of the failure, you can learn with the debugger which variable had which value, for example. And when you analyze that, you see that this pointer, for example, had an illegal value. And you know in which line of your uh, program it crashed. And then from there, you walk back and find where the error was and fix it. So the operating system should provide you means for debugging, like core dump uh, is a nice example of that. Now, this was what we discussed was a set of system services targeted for the user. It is also, uh, the operating system also provides some system services targeted for resource sharing and increasing the uh, efficiency of resource management, resource allocation in your uh, system. So the system has many resources. This, these resources are like, the CPU is a very important resource. Actually, we don't look at the CPU as a single resource, but you know, the CPU works with the clock, it's synchronized with the clock. So CPU actually provides CPU cycles. It's just like it provides some number of CPU cycles to this process, then so many to this one, so many to this one, so many to this one, okay? So these CPU cycles, that means the CPU time, is a very important resource. The memory, of course, is yet another important resource. The files and the directories are also resources. Like, uh, if I'm editing this file, say, with Word, you should not be able to edit it again with Word or some other uh, text editor, because if two of us modify the same file at the same time, then uh, the file will be corrupt. If, of course, the software cannot handle simultaneous editing of the same file, okay? So the files also become resources and we'd like to protect them and also provide uh, efficient use of that. Like if, uh, and yet another resources, of course, let me also mention that, the I.O. devices, like the disk or the printer, whatever. Like, if I'm uh, using the printer at the moment, if I'm printing something, you shouldn't be printing anything else, okay? Because it would be like, if I'm trying to print 10 pages and you try to print three pages, your three pages could go somewhere in my 
10 pages and to be a mixture. Words, if uh, what you're trying to print gets printed on the page I've been printing on, then it would be a real mess because this time part of the page would be from my process and the rest would be from your uh, process and you know just uh, it's something that we wouldn't want anyways uh, the operating system is responsible for allocating th these resources in a careful manner to protect the uh, output the results and also provide efficiency like i can find a solution to this but it takes bloody ages to complete for all processes if you come up with a better solution that works more efficiently, that keeps everyone happy, then that's a better solution. So the operating system should be providing such efficient solutions. Another one is accounting. Accounting is disabled in many operating systems, in many systems, because typically we give these, if you're a student uh, of our department, we either give you that resource or we don't give it, okay? Uh, typically, we don't charge for that. But it is, in real life, it is possible to charge for the use depending on how much you're using it, like this, how much CPU you're using or how much memory you're using or how much data transfer you're doing. According to all these, it is possible to charge people. One Example of that could be, for example, going back to that GPU or CPU uh, services we discussed earlier. We're not doing it, but it is possible, for example, to give every student some credit. Like every uh, month, say, I'm giving every user, uh, every PhD student, say, 1,000 hours of credit. That means 1,000 hours of CPU time or GPU time to use in the system. Now, if you don't use it by the end of the month, it's gone for the next month. I will give you a thousand uh, hours again. But if you consume it, say by mid of the month, then you cannot continue. You cannot use the system in the rest of the month. That could be an option. In that case, I'm doing some account management to your account i'm loading some credit and as you're using it now i should be measuring how much you're using and extracting it reducing it from your account from your credit so that at some point when you go to zero credit i can reject giving you the service that's one option this actually is being used for example in cloud systems like amazon they're charging you for the amount of CPU time uh, you're using or memory you're using or network access you're doing. So all these are in accounting. In most systems, as I said, this is disabled. But if you need it, you have to do it at the system level because it, you need to know how much CPU that process is using, for example, or how much memory it's using and also prevent it when necessary when the credit is over you should prevent accessing the system so managing all this is part of accounting uh, also an operating system should provide protection and security protection is protecting the memory space files uh, resources device uh, allocations uh, at that moment from other processes like, if uh, you should not be able to read or write from my, from my memory address. Because, for example, uh, I could be, say, logging in to my bank account. And there I'm providing my password, all my information. And if you're running on the same system and you're able to read from the memory address of my browser, even if you cannot write, even if you cannot modify it, you could read from there all the information that's private to me. Therefore, you should protect processes from other processes, even on the same system. Note that here, it doesn't have to be two users. It could be that 
for example, say I'm using Dropbox. It's my Dropbox. And here I'm entering my bank account. Now, if Dropbox process, although it belongs to me, is able to access the memory space of the web browser, I don't know uh, what kind of an application it is, actually. It could actually read that, uh, read all the private information that belongs to me, information about my bank account. I don't want that, but I don't know the executable code of Dropbox, but if my operating system prevents this process from accessing this process's space, I'm sure that it will not happen. Okay, so you should provide such protection and also security for outsiders. We don't want hackers to be able to enter our system, access our data, or maybe even modify our data, or even if they cannot access and or modify our data, our data is safe, it is possible that they will prevent me from entering the system, which is actually what the denial of service, those attacks do. Uh, it could be preventing this, so we don't want such things to happen, so that is security to be provided by the operating system. Now, if you look at, uh, in general, a computer system now, as we discussed earlier, uh, at the uh, very bottom, uh, sorry, uh, at the very bottom, we have the hardware. And the operating system is sitting on top of the hardware. This is the kernel of the operating system. That's preventing the upper layers accessing the hardware directly. You have to go through the kernel. In other words, you cannot do anything with the hardware. You have to ask the operating system to do it for you. So it's always passing uh, through the operating system. Now, in the operating system, you have the services, the system calls, which is actually providing the API. We'll come to that. And the user interfaces. And on top of uh, the operating system, we have the application programs, okay? Either your programs or uh, other systems programs like the, the LS, for example, for listing, whatever. All these are uh, the other application programs running. Now, the operating system, as we said, provides these services. It provides means for loading programs and creating processes, uh, doing I.O. operations, doing uh, file system operations, communications, resource allocation, accounting, protection and security, error detection. We all uh, talked about these. But note that these are very low level services. And upper layer uh, applications, processes, cannot deal with these uh, in that level, uh, and there has to be some guarantees that are given. So all these are handled by the system calls. The system calls are just like function definitions, okay? It means like you want to do IO operations, you want to read, well, you should tell me uh, to which, if, from which device you want to read, what is the address in that device? For example, if you want to read from the disk, tell me the disk ID, the location on the disk, like the cylinder numbers, sector numbers, uh, whatever. And how many bytes do you want to read? Okay, now this is how I can go and read it. But where am I going to put it? Okay, when I read it, where am I going to place the value that I have read. So you should also provide me the destination address. Okay? So device ID, uh, address on the device, the size of the data, and the destination address of the data. You should provide me these for the read operation. For the write operation, it's just the inverse. In that case, take the values from here, write to this address, so many bytes. Uh, for others, 
it's different. So all these are defined by the system call. So that means you want to read something? Tell me these values. Now, how do you make the device understand these values? It's done by the I.O. subsystem, the I.O. services, okay? But uh, you should be providing me these. So the system call defines these interfaces just like a function call. Remember in the case of function call, you have the parameters in a specific order, the types are known, the sizes are known. You have to provide all of those parameters, otherwise it doesn't work. Just the same thing. So the system calls actually defining the interface to these uh, system services. And on top, you have the user interfaces and your application uh, programs. Sorry. So, uh, we already discussed this, so I will be quite fast here. The command line interface, uh, in some systems it's implemented in the kernel, but in most systems, in the modern systems, that's typically implemented separately. It provides you the shell, the shell takes the command and the parameters, and uh, the command, as I said, either should be uh, built-in commands, or it could be the name of some other programs in your file system. If none, then it's not a valid command. Uh, there are uh, zillions of shells, uh, like uh, SH is the most basic, uh, if you talk about Unix-based systems, SH would be the most basic shell, but we have shell, uh, SH, uh, corn shell, KSH, C shell, uh, TC shell, uh, born shell, born again shell, Z shell, many of them, fish, all these are uh, commonly popular shells. You can even write your own shell, which could be also, by the way, a project in this course. Uh, we'll th think about that. Uh, so, uh, these are the uh, shells uh, that are used in the command line interface. Note that in most modern systems, you, you can start a shell inside the GUI, so you already have a GUI, but inside the GUI, once in a while, you want the command line interface, so you start a shell. But we're talking about systems that do not have GUI at all. So you boot the computer, all you have is that blank, a black screen where you have only the prompt. You first log in, then you get the prompt, and that's it, nothing else. So that would be the command line interface only. Using the command line interface inside the GUI is a GUI, it's still a GUI application in that case. Uh, the graphical user interface is creating, as you know, a desktop. There are icons on it. Uh, the It was originally, uh, now, for you it's so basic, but the most important thing is when there is no concept of a, a graphical user interface and the desktop uh, idea, Somebody thought about this. It was great to think about this when there was no example of it. It was Xerox that did that. But now you can find it uh, in all uh, operating systems. In, uh, my, for Microsoft, there is the Windows graphical user interface, which also provides a command shell with the command CMD. Uh, for Apple, Apple has a graphical user interface called Aqua, and in, Aqua is just the graphical user interface, you know, uh, it's like, this is Aqua, that's the graphical user interface of macOS, but behind that, below that, what's running is still a Unix system. It's a Unix flavor named Darwin, which is actually uh, extending uh, from the uh, BSD Unix which is a Unix flavor. Linux is yet another variation of, uh, we can say, uh, Unix, but it has grown uh, by itself and it really has become huge with many uh, different distributions. So Linux also has its own command line interface, 
but also optional GUIs, the graphical user interfaces like CDE, KDE, GNOME, Cinnamon, and many others. Xface, for example, it's a very light graphical user interface, but note that it's optional. For example, you can install a very basic, a very small, you can have very small uh, Linux implement uh, installations where you have no GUI, you just have the command line interface. That's also possible. For example, when we want, uh, when we don't want the uh, heavy weight of the graphical user interface, we uh, sometimes make only uh, GUI installations or for systems that have very low processing power, we don't install the GUI at all. And especially when we want also a very small memory footprint, that means we want to run Linux on a system with no graphical user interface. Okay, like you have many devices around, uh, you're not realizing that you're using them, but uh, they're running actually Linux. But since there is no human in touch with that, and there's not even a display, if there's no display, there's no means of installing GUI. So you can have a very small installation. By the way, there are also uh, very small uh, in Linux distributions that uh, come without any GUI and the purpose is having it very small, like uh, Alpine. And uh, there is also the class of portable devices, like your phones, tablets, whatever. Now, with these, there is something different. Now, first of all, they come with a, a typically a touch uh, screen interface, mostly. Uh, so when you have a touch screen interface, the device, first of all, the monitor is different. The touch screen is the monitor of your phone or tablet. The monitor is different because now it's not an output device, it's an input output device. Uh, the monitor is able to detect touch either by your finger or uh, by a pen. Now, depending on whether you touch with your pen or your finger, many things actually change, like uh, some allow you uh, to write uh, with very high precision on the screen with either finger or mostly with a pen. Some do not allow you to do that. Some have very, like mine, uh, pinpointed pens. Some are uh, just for drawing, uh, making drawings on the screen, not for writing. So these are very different devices. Also, these systems not come not only with the touch screen. And first of all, there is no keyboard. Therefore, you have to have a virtual keyboard. We typically don't have a mouse because uh, when you're you know riding the bus, you cannot use the mouse because there's no place to put the mouse. Uh, use the mouse. There's no mouse pad there. So typically, such systems do have some parts or hardware lacking, you don't have them, but they also have some hardware that we don't have in our regular computers, like the touch screen. Of course, now you have also laptops or desktops with the touch screen, but they're still rare compared to the others. So they have some additional hardware or utilities like the touch screen. They have sensors because when you rotate your phone or your tablet, it has uh, some uh, sensors on it that will understand the orientation and it will convert from portrait to landscape or vice versa. Or even in the case of phones, it's possible that you turn your phone upside down and it uh, serves as rejecting the call. So there are actually motion sensors on your, uh, in your phone that detect uh, such actions. It's also common to have voice commands. Of course, now, uh, like you have Siri also available on uh, Apple computers, but the original always comes with the uh, phones and uh, tablets, the uh, portable devices, because there is a need for that. Because it is difficult to type for example, when you're uh, driving, 
or when you are wearing gloves, whatever. So such operating systems now need to be capable of providing other means. Okay? But further, also, these systems have limited processing powers. So you have to uh, design everything to uh, have low uh, CPU complexity. These devices have limited battery power. So now you design these systems to turn off their screen, say, in 30 seconds if you're not using it, or even turn off, for example, GPS. These devices also, by the way, have most of them have GPS, but we don't have in most uh, computers. And also, for example, it turns off GPS when there is no process that's using it. There are also other things like since we have limited memory and limited power and uh, limited process, limited electric power and limited processing power. For example, uh, in context switching, these systems are not like the others. For most applications, if you switch to another application, it will just pause this application. It will not be running in the background. But there are also some applications that are running in the background. Uh, so uh, it's different for the case of mobile devices.